Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Robert Barton. He is professor in the Department of Anthropology and member of the Durham Cultural Evolution Research Centre at Durham University in the UK. He is an evolutionary biologist slash anthropologist interested in brains, behavior, and cognition using phylogenetic comparative methods to study how these traits evolved. He developed and tested the visual brain hypothesis for primate brain size evolution. He is currently interested in the underestimated role of the cerebellum in brain evolution and cognition. And he also works on the evolutionary and cultural significance of the color red. And we'll, we will try to go through most of that today. So Dr. Barton, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much. So let's start perhaps with a more general question. What would you say is the relationship or how do you look at the relationship between the evolution of the brain, cognition and behavior? Ah, yes, that is a very broad question. <laughs> um, so um, let me start with behavior. Um, so differences between individuals in behavior and in the way they respond to stimuli are what natural selection sees, if you like, um, and affect the fitness, the reproductive success and the survival of individuals. Um, uh, and so behavior is, is what natural selection works on. And then behavior is obviously influenced by a number of things, but one of the things is the cognitive processes the sensory perception systems, um, how good vision is, um, for example, uh, the emotional processes and um, so forth. And those are all things that um, influence behavior and therefore influence the outcome of selection pressures and survival. Um, and then brains are the mechanism of those uh, processes, uh, brains and um, neurophysiology, more generally uh, nervous systems, I would say, because I see brains as being fundamentally embodied um, in interacting with the body. And it's the interactions between the brain and the body that um, are really constitute cognitive processes and um, determine behavior. Um, and then the way that I study the relationship between these things is to take a very broad phylogenetic approach, looking at data for many different species and combining, com combining that with information about how those species are related to each other um, what uh, times they diverged evolutionarily from each other, and then using all of that information to try and work out um, how brains changed in size and structure through time at different points in phylogeny, and correlating um, that information with information about the behavior of the different species and what we know about their cognitive processes. So fairly general answer for a general question. Yeah, uh, we will try to break it down through the next questions, let's say. Uh, okay, so I know that uh, you focus your work on primates a lot. So what explains the evolution of large brains and cognitive skills in primates? I mean, what are the main factors there? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, and um, one answer is we still don't know for sure, um, because there's still a lot of debate between people's uh, sort of favorite theories. So um, the very well known theory is, is called the social brain hypothesis. And um, I've been involved in, in testing that one over the years. And that's the idea that really the thing that distinguishes primates with big brains from other mammals is their sociality that they're very good at managing complex social relationships in large social networks within their social groups. And that that's what's the most cognitively demanding uh, kind of factor. Um, but other people think that foraging strategies and the way you make a living, the way you find your food, the way maybe you extract your food 
from different uh, substrates, like uh, if you have to dig it up, if you have to break open, um, difficult to um, break um, husks and shells and this kind of thing. Um, uh, or remember the location of different kinds of foods that that, that may have had a, an influence. Um, so there's kind of two broad theories, foraging related theories and um, social complexity theories. And there are different versions within those. Um, at the, it's been an interesting history of the development of those ideas because for many years, it was widely um, kind of assumed that um, social complexity was the answer. And most of the evidence seemed to be in that direction. But in recent years, the ecological theories have come back because larger scale studies looking at many different many species you know more than 100 species to um, look at the evolution of brains have found that um, ecological factors seem to be more important than people had thought um, but this is an ongoing debate and um, I, I will I will say something else about this which is that um, sometimes it's not even really possible to separate these things out because they're interrelated. So how um, you forage um, relates to um, the way you manage your social relationships. It might not be possible to, to completely separate those things. Um, and the other thing that we've found um, that I think is relevant here is that there isn't any one single explanation that will explain everything, that will explain um, the evolution of large brains uh, right across the tree of life. What we find is that there are different patterns uh, and different, for example, different brain systems that have changed in response to different selection pressures at different times on different parts of the tree of life. And so ultimately, the overall size of the brain doesn't necessarily tell you that much. You have to delve down beneath the surface and look at which particular brain systems have changed and in response to which specific kinds of factors. And, and then you get a very complex picture, which is turning out to be quite interesting. Yeah. And what about specific evolutionary mechanisms like sexual selection, mm. social selection? Do those play an important role in the relative size of different brain structures, for example? Yeah, you might expect so. Um, there hasn't been that much work on the sexual selection side, and I think that's a, a, a bit of a gap in research. Um, but certainly there are um, brain areas in primates, you know, that are, are involved in regulating sexual behavior and, um, you know, maybe different in males and females. Although there's been a lot of attention paid to possible sex differences in the brains of, of men and women in, in humans, we know almost nothing about the evolution of sex differences um, in the brain in terms of what, what's happening in other species, um, whether certain uh, brain systems are more different, uh, have evolved to be more different um, than other brain systems. So, so we don't know much about that side of things. Um, in terms of um, social, socially related systems, in primates we know that there are systems that are particularly involved in um, monitoring and responding to social signals, uh, which can be quite complex. If you imagine yourself in a social group and you imagine the signaling going back and forth uh, between individuals and, um, uh, and you, you, you think about the information that you have to keep track of to understand what's going on in your social world, um, then it makes sense that there are specialized brain systems that, that are good at doing that. And um, so, for example, we see in the temporal lobe of the brain um, and in parts of the limbic system, in the amygdala, for example, there are, there are areas that respond specifically to social, um, social information. And there's some evidence that um, sociality has uh, led to in some cases, larger nuclei, for example, within these particular systems.
Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, can we say here that when it comes to several different factors that people analyze when it comes to explaining the evolution of brain size and particular brain regions, I mean, that uh, it could be the case that they do not necessarily have to be in contradiction with one another. I mean, it could be several multiple factors, ecological, social, et cetera, contributing to that, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's a, one good reason why we really need to go beyond just looking at brain size um, and, and, and dig down because, you know, and, and do more focused, more detailed work on how particular systems have changed in response to particular factors. And I think, you know, to the extent that we, we've we been doing that, we, we're finding lots of evidence for quite complex patterns. And as you say, you know, different uh, factors uh, can be involved. We don't have to, it's not necessarily the case that there's, there's a single explanation. Yeah. What about uh, the life history of a particular species? What is yeah. the relationship between that and the brain or brain evolution? Yeah, there, um, it's for a long time it's been known that large brains, the evolution of large brains, goes along with um, certain characteristics of the life history. So large brain species in, in both primates, but uh, in other groups of mammals and birds as well, um, are associated with generally slower life histories, with slow development, late maturation, and longer lifespans. And again, there's more than one theory to try and explain um, these patterns. Um, quite a popular idea is, is the idea that um, Having a large brain provides you with a kind of cognitive buffer against environmental variation. So that if you live in a in a complicated and unpredictable world um, where things can change rapidly, having a large brain can be advantageous to kind of predict what might be about to happen, to respond flexibly. Um, and the, this in turn is associated with um, a longer lifespan because it enables you to survive better in, in these kinds of circumstances. There's an alternative explanation, which is um, that whatever it is that selects for um, cognitive abilities and having a large brain has a, a knock-on effect on development, that um, large brains take longer to grow and wire up. They're quite expensive organs, um, both in terms of their metabolic running costs, but also in terms of their development. And um, so we see that large brain species take longer to reach maturity and their brain growth tends to go on longer, both during gestation, during pregnancy, but also after birth and humans being a particular case in point, where our brains carry on growing quite steeply, quite a rapid rate for several years after birth. Um, and um, the way that this growth is supported is essentially through the mother um, in mammals, okay. at any rate, um, uh, through a process we call maternal investment, um, through um, channeling resources, nutritional resources and energy to the growing infant, both uh, in the uterus and then after birth, through lactation, through suckling the young. And that um, those species that undergo protracted postnatal, post birth brain growth, um, they also, there is a longer period of suckling and lactation by the mother. Um, and so this inevitably slows everything down, um, and that maturity is reached later. Uh, and actually, in a study that, that we published um, about 10 years ago, looking at the relationship between all of these variables, um, we found that really um, the closest link was between maternal investment, uh, brain growth and adult brain size. And that once you'd accounted for that, there was no further relationship to, uh, for example, lifespan. So we call this the developmental costs hypothesis. And we think that it's that, um, that's the main explanation for this link between large brains and slow life histories. 
it just takes a long time to to grow and wire up a, a big and complicated brain. Mm -hmm. And from an evolutionary perspective, do we have any idea how the sequence of events play out there? I mean, what comes first? Is it higher levels of Pattern or parental, or in this case, maternal investment, and then comes brain growth and slower life histories. Is it mm. the other way around? I mean, is that even a good question to ask? Or not? No, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to answer um, because, certainly, in these broad scale um, phylogenetic comparative analyses. Um, It's difficult to, um, you know, when you're talking about timescales of many millions of years, so just looking at primate evolution, that's occurred over a period of 55 million years. Um, we make these reconstructions about, you know, what events happened when on the basis of quite crude, um, relatively sort of large scale patterns. And it's very, very difficult to pin down the precise timing of different evolutionary events when particular genes changed that might be associated with um, changes in the brain or, or with changes in the pattern of physiological investment by the mother, that sort of thing. So that it's a really tricky question to answer. Um, there may be some experimental techniques uh, for, for, you know, by which one could do this um, in animal models, perhaps. Um, this is not the kind of work that I do, um, um, but um, the, the, the basic answer to your question is we don't know what, what happened when, but I would expect that things you know, tended to be fairly simultaneous because um, once you have selection on um, something, some kind of cognitive ability that requires more neural tissue, then you have to have the accompanying change in um, in investment and in development that um, allows that to to happen so um, you know it's a kind of chicken and egg it's very difficult to say which came first mm -hmm. so tell us now what does the mammalian placenta have to do with all of this i mean with maternal investment rates of development and so on well um The structure of the mammalian placenta varies between groups of mammals and between species, um, and it varies in quite interesting ways that may be related to the channeling of resources to uh, the offspring. Um, so some uh, placentas are more invasive, where the, um, the tissue of the fetus invades the wall of, of the uterus um, and it looks like a system where there's closer, more direct contact between um, the, the, the blood supply of the mother, effectively, and um, the tissues of the fetus. Um, so the more direct contact. Um, in other kinds of placenta, um, there are membranes, um, additional membranes between the tissues of the mother and the tissues of, of the fetus, so less direct contact. And it's been speculated for many years that something about um, an invasive placenta allowed um, more efficient transfer of resources, maybe faster growth, um, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you study the evolution of the cerebellum? I mean, what's interesting about it? Well, it's um, a, a structure that has been so relatively neglected by um, neuroscience and uh, by evolutionary biologists. We have, you know, the, the, the structure of the brain that is considered to be kind of the main structure, if you like, in humans and other mammals is the cerebral cortex, this thin layer of um, tissue at the surface of the brain that looks... Um, very large. If you just look at a human brain, it seems it's the largest structure in the brain. It seems to have expanded more than other structures. Um, and then there are all these other brain structures that um, just at look in terms of looking at brains don't seem to have changed that much. But 
we started to find when we um, used objective methods, measures to quantify evolutionary changes in different regions of the brain, that we were picking up um, all sorts of interesting changes elsewhere. And that actually um, attention had focused on the cortex, um, too much attention had focused on it really, to the extent of excluding these other structures. It turns out that the cortex tends to balloon up in size because um, that's just the way that you scale up a brain from small to large, not because necessarily the cortex um, is the most important part. Um, so we started to find with the stru structures like the cerebellum that there have been really interesting changes um, at different, again, different changes on different parts of the tree of life at different times. One finding that really stood out um, uh, and attracted our attention and, and made us study, study the cerebellum more was that across primate evolution, generally there's been a close relationship between changes in the cerebral cortex and changes in the cerebellum. So they're, they're closely interrelated. And that's one interesting point, that when one of them changes, the other tend to, tends to change as well, suggesting that this really we shouldn't be focusing on a single structure like the cortex. We should be focusing on the interconnections between these structures that change together. But then um, we noticed that in a sort of phylogenetically close to humans, amongst the other apes, um, we see a change in the pattern of evolution where not only um, is the cerebellum. Um, important, but it becomes almost more important than the cortex um, in that there was a rapid increase in the size of the cerebellum um, early on in ape evolution and that that carried on throughout the evolution of um, other apes to um, the living species like chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans, which have therefore ended up with a large cerebellum, but also in humans. So this told us that, um, you know, here's a structure that people have, have rather neglected and this is assumed to be involved in fairly sort of uninteresting basic processes, but had expanded rapidly in humans' relatively recent phylogenetic history. And, and we should therefore try and work out why and, and what it's doing. So, I mean, does that mean that the cerebellum is one of the brain regions that in apes and humans is characteristically larger than in comparison yeah. to other species? It does. It, it is, it's exactly that. So um, it, it's significantly bigger after um, taking into account the size of the cortex. So relative to the size of our cortex, we have a large cerebellum compared to other primates. And the other interesting thing about the cerebellum is that although it's only about 10 to 15 percent of the volume of the brain, it actually has most of the neurons of the brain. So the cerebellum has, uh, the human cerebellum has about four times more neurons in it than does our cerebral cortex. So it's very densely packed with neurons. Um, and it kind of flips everything on its head. It sort of says, well, you know, instead of the cortex being the supposed pinnacle of evolution. Maybe it's the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us more about the functions the cerebellum is associated yeah. with. Yeah. Just perhaps to try to understand why it might be the case that the cerebellum has evolved and become yeah. became larger in apes and humans. So traditionally, the cerebellum has been, uh, the function of the cerebellum has been seen as the control of the body, essentially, mm -hmm. balance, coordination, control of movements. Um, and it wasn't considered to have cognitive functions. Um, now, there are two kind of ways in which the field has developed in more recent times. One is that increasingly, uh, brain imaging studies, for example, studies of people with lesions have picked up that the cerebellum is intimately involved in cognitive processes. And then the second way in which it's developed has been theoretically with the, the rise of interest in the idea that cognition 
um, is not separate from control of the body, that they're intimately interrelated. And this is the, um, the idea of embodied cognition. Um, so that one can't really separate out uh, completely the sensory guidance and control of movement. For example, when I reach for something using my hand and I maybe manipulate it in um, complicated ways to achieve. I talked about the foraging hypothesis for brain size earlier. And, and one idea is that what you know great apes are particularly good at is manipulating things and it's um, working out how to remove nutritious food items from uh, a difficult uh, substrate of some kind from a fishing for termites, for example, chimpanzees are famous for fishing for termites, removing them from a termite mound using twigs of grass. And you have to be able to, man to make a tool, um, uh, strip the um, pieces off the twig to make it a nice sort of fishing rod and then probe it into the holes in the termite mound and diggle around and pull it out with termites on it. All sorts of compli complex patterns of behavior like that, which turn out to be simultaneously complicated in sensory motor terms, but also cognitive terms. So um, the cerebellum is intimately involved. We, knew, we always knew it was involved in the direct control of these movements. But if you think about um, engaging in a complicated sequence of actions, that's involved in, for example, termite fishing, then um, essentially what you've got there is if you've got a control system for doing something like that, you've potentially got a system that can make all kinds of predictions about the consequences of your actions. And this we think has become essentially the substrate of um, many cognitive processes that we think of as uniquely human. What I'm doing now is stringing along complicated sequences of words together into sentences, hopefully more or less coherent, um, uh, which is, um, you know, an increasing view is that this is analogous to the organization of patterns of movement and um, the role of the brain and in particular the cerebellum in making predictions about what will happen if I move in a particular way um, or uh, in imagining the consequences if I if I do something what 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 maybe in a social domain even what um, if I behave in a certain way what will be the outcome in in terms of my social world so the cerebellum seems to have a very general role in controlling um, actions but also in planning um, and predicting um, in in many different domains. Mm -hmm. So this means then that the idea of a disembodied brain or even a disembodied nervous system wouldn't make any sense whatsoever, much less the idea that uh, the brain by itself would be able to produce cognition or even higher cognitive abilities. Right. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the embodied brain um, idea really um, kicks back against um, some of traditional kind of cognitive science, seeing cognition as separate from the body, as being a, simply a set of abstract processes that could be implemented within any sort of computer. Uh, and I think this is part of the reason why, um, you know, uh, computational models have, um, uh, um, have have not always been successful in simulating human behavior because they don't take account of the way that, you know, the human nervous system is situated within a very particular kind of body and they're co-adapted to each other. Uh, and, you know, in primates, we know that these are really important and these are, <laughs> our eyes are really important and the coordination. And I think, you know, our hypothesis is that at the origin of primates, there was the evolution of a specialized system for visuomotor control, visual guidance of hand movements, and that that triggered off a whole set of changes that involved structures like the cerebellum um, and led to our distinctive form of embodied cognition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I also asked you about that because it seems to me that over time embodied cognition has been gaining more and more track in cognitive science and uh, throughout 
even the centuries in philosophy and then more recently in cognitive science ideas like uh, the, uh, a mind separate from the body or then the brain separate from the body. I mean, it doesn't seem that they will last much longer in science. No, I, I think, you know, um, things are going in that direction. And, um, you know, obviously uh, the philosopher Descartes um, yeah. saw mind and body as being very separate. And if you ask cognitive neuroscientists today whether they agree with Descartes, you know, I don't think many would um, say that they do. And yet, we still, it's so easy to lapse back into that way of thinking about thinking, that it is a, um, a separate process divorced from the body. And, and a lot of uh, writing and, and work about the, the neural basis of behavior tends to slip back into that way of thinking about thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but basically focusing cognition on the brain right yeah mm -hmm. yeah instead of on you know the um the way in which you know brains nervous systems bodies and environments are uh, intermeshed with each other and you know if so if you think about very different species of mammals um uh, like primates with our um with our hand eye coordination and our manipulative abilities compared to other big brained species um, like elephants that manipulate things with their trunk but don't have very good vision, um, or um, dolphins that also have very large brains but um, cannot do any manipulation, but they have incredible hearing systems and auditory communication systems and navigation systems in a 3D world. Then I think it, it, it doesn't really make sense to be looking for um, similarities, just the similarities in, in their cognitive processes, we, we at least need to understand as well um, the way in which our worlds are very different, our sensory worlds and our, um, the way in which we have to control our bodies in our environments are very, very different for these different species. And therefore, you know, this should be reflected in our brains and in our cognitive processes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the philosopher Nagel said, uh, asked, in a famous essay, what is it like to be a bat? I th and, uh, you know, that's a, a very nice question. And, you know, his answer was, well, you, we can never know. Um, and I think to an extent he's right. We can't know what it feels like to be a bat. But um, we can at least appreciate the ways in which it might be very different um, to be a bat than to be a human living in a, in a very different sensory motor world. Yeah. So tell us now about the visual brain hypothesis. What is it? Yeah. So this relates to what I was saying, which is that you know one of the key adaptations of primates in which primates differ is in their visual systems. So primates um, notably have stereo vision so compared to other mammals. Our um, eyes are much more facing to the front. They've, they've rotated round from being on the side of us to, to being forward pointing to a greater extent than any other mammal. We see it a little bit in some other predators like cats, for example, but it's, it's greatest, it reaches its greatest extent in primates. And this is associated with the evolution of grasping hands and fingers um, and um, the visually guided manipulation of objects. Um, we also see that there are large territories of the primate brain that are um, involved in processing visual stimuli. And um, in, in monkeys, for example, more than half of um, the cortex, just looking at the cortex alone, more than half of it is essentially dedicated to visual processing. Um, although there are complicated interactions between different um, brain regions, but there's certainly visual visual information is an important part of um, what primate brains are processing. So going back to this question about why large brains evolved, um, you know, putting these different facts together led to the hypothesis that, well, one reason why primates evolved large brain would be to um, support um, their distinctive visual specializations. Uh, so we 
in short, we tested that by looking at relationships between the evolution of the size of the brain um, and the evolution of uh, visual specializations. Across primate species, there's variation in, for example, in stereo vision. Some species um, have uh, eyes even more to the front than other species. And we find that the, the brain size is correlated with the degree of uh, the degree to which the eyes point to the front. Um, brain size correlates with the size of the optic nerve, which is the nerve carrying information from the eye to the brain. And overall, you know, con lots of different pieces of evidence um, suggest that um, one of the important factors, even if we can't be sure about the precise behavioral consequences, um, at, a, at the level of physical adaptations um, in the brain and in the eyes, brains and visual systems have evolved together. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so what general aspects of primate brain evolution does the visual brain hypothesis explain then? Well, it, it, essentially, um, it uh, explains how and why species vary in their um, visual acuity. So your visual acuity is your ability to um, make fine-grained distinctions in your visual world, for example, um, uh, to, to distinguish between uh, letters on the page. And primates have unusually high visual acuity, but it also varies between species. Um, and it's um, stereo acuity. So again, it goes back to the to, to this evolution of stereo vision. So that's you know, uh, at the origin of primates, there was a shift in that direction, which has um, then been selected more or less in different lineages of primates. Um, in uh, the uh, monkeys and apes that are more closely related to humans, there, were, there was an upward shift in the degree of um, stereoacuity. Um, this has res been correlated with the evolution of specialized brain systems for managing that information with larger brains. Now, once again, we see this as related to cognitive evolution because um, we believe that our, our thinking processes are intimately related to the way that we perceive the world. We tend to, if you think about kind of analogies that uh, people make, you know, if it, uh, in the English language anyway, if you're having a discussion and somebody's trying to explain something to you um, and you suddenly get it, you say, oh, I see what you mean. Um, and we have all of these kind of visual analogies for um, the way that we understand things. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. I think fundamentally our cognitive processes are kind of quite visual, mm -hmm. visually based. Yeah, by the way, just uh, for curiosity, uh, in Portuguese, we have the same kind of expression. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, looking back in the evolution of the primate brain, uh, when exactly did it start growing? Ah, well, um, uh, we, we are just, we've just been working on that. Um, we have not published this work yet, <laughs> so I can't... Um, definitively point you to the published work that shows this. But um, interestingly, we find that um, it wasn't until, you know, some tens of millions of years into the evolution of primates. So initially, going back to what you were asking about what happened first, initially there were some visual specializations and then it seems selection worked more on brains to take advantage of those visual specializations. So um, it's really where there are two main groups of primates. There's the lemurs and lorises, which are largely nocturnal, small species that are, are not in some ways not that different from um, other small bodied mammals that um, come out at night. Um, some of them have evolved to um, come out during the day and have better vision and so forth. So there's a little bit of a, a trend there, but it's really with the other group um, that led to the modern monkeys and apes that we start to see 
more dramatic increases in brain size and changes in um, in the brain after that point. Mm-hmm. Did the rates of growth accelerate in the hominin lineage? Um, they did. Um, so particularly in the last two million years, we see a rapid increase in brain size in the lineage leading to modern humans and this occurred in parallel on different branches um, because we know from fossil evidence that um, other large brain species evolved and and then died out so there seems to have been a general trend um, and that's some earlier work uh, we we found that across primates generally there was a general trend for brain size to increase through time but then this um, became more rapid in uh, hominins uh, uh, leading up to to modern humans. And indeed, as you suggested, it it accelerated. So um, a few years ago um, with Ian Miller and Charlie Nunn, I did some work where we analyzed data on fossils within a phylogenetic framework. And we found a strong signal that not only was a directional change and increase through time, but this accelerated towards the present. That's quite interesting because an accelerating pattern of evolution suggests some kind of positive feedback process. Um, that it wasn't just a case of you know something selected for large brains, but something selected for large brains, and that led to a change which, in its turn, created more selection for large brains. So some kind of escalating positive feedback process. Mm-hmm. But is there anything special or unusual about the human brain, or is it what we would typically expect of a primate exposed to the kinds of selective pressures we were exposed to? So yes and no, I think is the answer to that. Uh, it's an interesting. This field has an interesting history that um, people are always um, keen to demonstrate that humans are unique in some mm-hmm. way. Although Darwin talked about it in terms of whether there was a, a just a quantitative difference between humans and other species or a qualitative shift. Um, and he, he came down on the side of it was just a kind of a matter of gradation. That, so although we were different, um, it was through a continuous process of evolution with no kind of totally unique characteristics but at the time people kicked back against this um, and um, Owen for example suggested there was a structure in the human brain called the hippocampus minor which wasn't found in any other species and it was what gave us our kind of you know set us apart from nature Um, but there was a religious aspect to this kind of reasoning I think and Huxley then dissected a load of um, primate brains and showed that the structure that Owen claimed was unique to humans was in fact present in these other species. Um, So kind of siding with Darwin that although things change in size, there's nothing qualitatively unique. Now that debate has carried on until the current time and people still search for something about the human brain that makes, sets us completely apart. Um, I think that's a bit of a, what we call a wild goose chase. Um, I, I think um, there have been lots of quantitative changes, but there's very little evidence for any completely unique structures in our brains. The the wiring, the way that connections are made between different structures um, can change, um, and the size of those structures can change, relative size compared to other structures can change. But generally, natural selection has to work with what's already there. Um, to expand or contract or rewire what's already there. And that's that's the predominant pattern that we see. Mm-hmm. So when, when people are trying to explain what's different between humans and other closely related apes, should we be looking at the brain for answers in terms of whatever kinds of structures evolved in this or that way or how it's wired or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think we should. Um, uh, In answer to your first question, I said, well, nervous systems are the substrate or provide the mechanisms of cognition 
um, which influence behavior. Um, and so if we're interested in um, how and why human behavior is different, then we're, we're going to find the answer at least partly in brains. Now, of course, there are complicated um, sort of interactional ramifying feedbacks between um, culture, society, behavior, and cognitive processes. So we need to, again, we need to understand how brains are embedded in um, bodies, but also in um, social systems and cultures to fully get a full understanding of the picture. And sometimes things that we, you know, patterns of behavior that we think are very complicated or are complicated um, don't necessarily depend on extremely complicated mechanisms. They kind of emerge out of the interaction of relatively simple kind of cognitive processing rules and environments. Um, and so you get this kind of feedback process happening. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and it's quite interesting that you can actually, again, people who do robotics, for example, and try to get robots to do complex behaviors. Um, generally, you know, what that field has found is that you can, there's a limit to what you can program in, in terms of complexity. What you, the most effective approach is to understand how robots um, interact with their worlds and just tweak certain processes um, that enable uh, an organism, or in this case, an artificial organism, to do something quite complicated on the basis of a relatively simple mechanism. Mm -hmm. What about our uh, frontal lobes, particularly the prefrontal cortex? Uh, I mean, because people focus a lot on that in humans because of things related to reasoning, decision making, yeah. self control, yeah. and all of the, that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, should we be focusing on that when trying to explain certain behavioral differences between humans and other apes? And is that uh, a good source of uh, explanatory power, let's say, to, to those differences? Yeah, I mean, this is another area where I think, you know, the history and culture of science uh, are really interesting to look at, you know, what questions people have asked and why. And in my view, there's been an unhealthy obsession with the frontal lobes and in particular the prefrontal cortex. And then it kind of goes back to a Cartesian way of thinking. There must be some special cognitive process that's separated from, from all the other things and will be located in a particular part of the brain. And when we look at the human brain, we see we seem to have these bulbous frontal lobes. Oh, that must be where, you know, um, human intelligence resides. Um, and again, it's kind of separating out intelligence from um, more basic uh, control processes, which I think theoretically is a mistake. Um, but also, you know, when we looked at this question as uh, whether the prefrontal cortex is enlarged over above and beyond what you would predict for a, a, an ape of our overall brain size, we found no evidence that that was the case. We looked at several data sets and human frontal regions, prefrontal cortex and so on, is exactly what you would predict for an ape with um, our overall brain size. So they are very important regions. They have extremely important functions. Um, in my view, the idea of um, executive control and self-control has also uh, been overemphasized because of a cultural tendency to think of humans as being, you know, archetypally good at controlling our instincts. I think that's the wrong way to look at things personally. But in, anyway, empirically, you know, we don't find that um, the, the pattern that people have claimed actually exists. And, I, and I, I trace a lineage between contemporary interest in the prefrontal cortex all the way back to people like Owen claiming that the, the hippocampus minor was what set us apart. Um, that, you know, there must be some special structure that has been the focus of, of evolution in some way. Um, and it's just much more complicated than that and much messier and much more interesting biologically, I think, 
Um, and, and what we need to do is look at the connections between these areas. So the prefrontal cortex has important connections ultimately with structures like the cerebellum. And if we want to understand the human brain, we need to understand these large scale neural networks, not a, some specialized bit that we find at the front of the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also because even if we want to just focus on the brain, it's not that the prefrontal cortex operates in isolation. I mean, as you said, it's connected to the cerebellum and it also receives important inputs from the limbic system, for example, yeah. for decision yeah. making. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I think it, it, what we found is that structures tend to change together. There are exceptions to that where, you know, we have a, a what we call a mosaic pattern where individual structures change relative to others. But even then, um, it tends to not be single structures, but nuclei uh, in uh, different regions distributed across the brain that change in concert with each other. Um, so to understand, you know, the evolution of the, the neural basis of cognitive capacities, we really need to understand it at that sort of network type level. Mm -hmm. So one last topic then, uh, what is the evolutionary significance of the color red? And no. I mean, first of all, why did you decide to study this color specifically? So this is completely separate really from the brain work, although you could, you could see that there could be links to it. Um, I, you know, in other research I do, I, I mean, I, I've worked on the behavior of non-human primates in the wild, and many of my colleagues do that uh, here at Durham as well. Um, and um, one of the things we're interested in is the evolution of uh, um, color as a signal across different species. So many species of, of primates, but also some birds and reptiles uh, and other species that have good color vision, um, we noticed the, a distinctive pattern where um, the color red seems to be particularly salient and particularly important um, for signaling dominance, particularly by male animals in their sexually selected um, uh, interactions with uh, other males, so competition um, between males for females. And dominant males, for example, the mandrel monkey that has um, the red nose um, surrounded by blue, um, work by a colleague of mine, Joe Setchell, had shown that the amount of red in a mandrel male's face is associated with his testosterone levels and with his dominance. When, when males become very dominant, they have very red faces, and that this is a signal to other males. We know that you know when humans are in dominance interactions, if they're feeling angry and uh, confident, they tend to flush red with anger. If you're frightened, you go pale, so the blood drains away from your face. And um, we just thought, well, maybe there's something going on here with a signal in humans as well that's a bit more subtle. Um, and how could we test that? And then I was having coffee with my colleague, Russell Hill, one day, some years ago, and we were chatting about this. And I said, hey, you know, um, what about combat sports like boxing and wrestling? Um, and we came up with this idea that just there is already an almost natural experiment there because um, in the Olympic Games, for example, in boxing, individuals were randomly assigned to wear either red outfits or blue outfits. So we thought, well, if, this, if the colour red has kind of subconscious effects on your perception of, of the other individual, maybe it will, it will influence the outcome of uh, these contest sports, these, these combat sports. Um, so in short, we, we got a load of data from the 2004 Olympic Games. This is going back some time now. Um, and um, we found indeed that across four different combat sports, competitors assigned to wear red won significantly larger proportion of bouts than those assigned to wear blue. 
Um, which we, I must admit, we didn't really believe we were going to get that result when we set out to do it. It was kind of like um, a bit of fun, but it turned out that there was an effect. Um, and we then did some experiments and other people have done experiments. Um, there was a, a team in Germany that found that in Taekwondo, the way it seemed to work was by influencing um, the scoring of judges. So they showed judges videos of uh, contests uh, between Taekwondo competitors. And uh, then they digitally reversed the color of the outfits and showed the, the uh, bouts to a new set of judges and found that it uh, influenced, changed the scoring. Um, and we did experiments where we showed people images where we digitally manipulated the color of the T-shirt and asked people to rate this person for, you know, dominance and confidence and all sorts of characteristics. And again, we found um, significant effects. So, you know, um, we, I think these effects are very subtle and can only be apparent when everything else is, is level when when there's no other when there are no other factors really making a difference um, but uh, they do seem to have, color does seem to have um, these these interesting psychological effects on on social perceptions in particular mm -hmm. so I also wanted to ask you because I've heard people talking about this hypothesis does red and perhaps other colors or could they have anything to do? with fruit because there are people that say that we evolved to see red to be able to identify ripe fruit yeah. does that make sense or not i think it does um uh, i think that that is very likely the reason um why um full uh, what we call trichromatic color vision evolved to distinguish ripe fruit from a background of green leaves there's quite a bit of evidence for that once you've got that um, good color vision, um, you'd see you'd be likely to see the evolution of kind of secondary adaptations that exploit that oh, ability. Okay. So the evolution of social signals based on differences between individuals in, in coloration. So I think the social aspect is secondary to the foraging aspect. Mm -hmm. So are there any other ways the effects of red manifest culturally in human societies? Well, I mean, um, red is, uh, uh, you know, free, very frequently used as a signal of danger. Um, it's associated with anger. We talk about a red rag to a bull, although bulls don't have uh, trichromatic vision. So it may be more about the humans watching this. Um, uh, and we, you know, a red traffic light tells you to, you know, stop and so forth. Um, so I think it is manifest throughout human culture. And there's some evidence that this is cross-cultural as well. Um, uh, but um, that's something that hasn't really been followed up properly and would be interesting to do, whether red tends to be used in war paint, for example, um, and, and those kinds of situations. Oh, the, that's very interesting. So some of these things like the red light in the traffic could could not be arbitrary, right? Yeah, I mean, there. I guess there are, there are two hypotheses. One is just that it's very visible and that's important when you've got a, okay. a warning signal. But, you know, I think once you've got something like that, um, then it, as I say, you get secondary adaptations where um, you get, a physiological response to that which is associated with you know the fear systems in the brain and so forth certainly you know if you grow up in a culture where red has those meanings it could be partly just that we come to associate red with certain meanings so there's definitely a cultural aspect to it as well mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Barton, uh, before we go, would you like to mention where can people find you and your work on the internet? Oh, well, just go to Durham University um, or go if you Google uh, my name and Durham, uh, you will find my webpage, um, uh, my personal webpage at Durham University. Um, that would probably be the main way, and there's a list of publications and so so forth there, and um, you can you, 
I think you can find my email um, there too. So. Okay, so thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been real, really fun to talk to you. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. It's been fun. Thanks, Ricardo. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Kavanagh, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punta, Radana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.